Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Um, Adrienne Kennedy is one of the country's most influential playwrights, and yet she never achieved commercial success. For the first time, one of Kennedy's plays will appear on Broadway when Audra McDonald stars in The Ohio State Murders, an autobiographically inspired play that addresses the violence of racism. We have today three Kennedy scholars discussing her work and its impact on the American theater. Our first panelist uh, is going to be Khalid Long. He's an assistant professor of theater and coordinator of theater studies at Columbia College, Chicago. Dr. Long teaches courses in theater history, African-American theater uh, and performance, American drama, performance studies, seminar on August Wilson and the art of drag. He is a freelance dramaturg and has worked on several productions by prominent playwrights, including Adrian Kennedy, Lynn Nottage, Dominique Morisot and August Wilson. Dr. Long is currently working on his manuscript, An Architect of Contemporary Black Feminist Theater, Glenda Dickerson, Transnational Feminism and the Kitchen Prayers series, which is due to come out on the University of Iowa Press. Our next panelist, Kristen Wright, is a consortium for faculty diversity fellow at Mount Holyoke College and soon to be an assistant professor at New York University. Her work exists at the intersections of African-American drama from the 19th century to the present, Black performance studies and critical theory. Wright is also a playwright and dramaturg, and her plays Apple Corps, Miss Anne, The Shirt, Civility, and Jamal from Empire, Jodeci for White Girls, and The Pop Cycle were produced at Cornell University and the Spring Rights Literary Festival. Finally, Leslie Ferris is the former chair of the Department of Theater and currently Arts and Humanities Distinguished Professor Emeritus here at The Ohio State University. Her research interests focus on gender and performance, carnival, and the use of masks. Her books include Acting Women, Images of Women in Theater, Crossing the Stage, Controversies on Cross-Dressing, and most recently, Contemporary Women Playwrights into the 21st Century, which she co-edited with Penny Farfan. Dr. Ferris has directed over 50 productions, both in London, South Africa, and the United States, including a movie star has to star in black and white in New York. So I'll turn this over to our first panelist, Dr. Khalid Long. Thank you. Um, it's so wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, I've actually prepared a little, a short talk um, and my talk is inspired by a recent production of Adrian Kennedy and Adam Kennedy's Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles, in which I served as the production dramaturg um, at Ford Theater in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and I know that, you know, we're on a limited time here, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started, and I look forward to some comments and questions later. Um, and the title of today's talk is Adrian Kennedy's Documentary Theater. Adrian Kennedy's career as a playwright stretches over five decades. She wrote her first play, Funny House of a Negro, in 1964, which won her an Obie Award for Distinguished Play. Kennedy wrote her most recent play, He Brought Her Back in a Box, in 2018, as a world premiere for theater for a new audience at Polanski Shakespeare Center in Brooklyn. In between these book and plays, Kennedy has written a body of work that defies conventionality and easy categorization. Furthermore, she has taught at several academic institutions, including Yale University, Stanford University, Brown University, Harvard University, Princeton, NYU, and the University of California at Berkeley. And she has won significant awards, including a Guggenheim Award, a Rockefeller Foundation Grant, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Lifetime Achievement, the Penn Laura Pels International Foundation for Theater Award, the American Book Award for Award for 1990, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Literature, among others. Kennedy was inducted into the Theater Hall of Fame in 2018, and as recently as August 2021, Kennedy was named the recipient of the Dramatist Guild of America's Lifetime Achievement Award. Without question, Kennedy's long career has established her as one of the most important figures of American theater. While the dramaturgy of surreal expressionistic expressionist poetic theater has placed Kennedy within a theatrical avant-garde in America, according to Paul Bryant Jackson and Lois Overbeck, her subjects profoundly challenge the problematic of race, culture, gender, and class. As such, 
Her audiences witnessed the devastating and alienating effects of colonialism, racism, and sexism. Even more, Kennedy's plays are snippets of her life interspersed within her dramas. Since the premiere of Kennedy's first play, Funny House of a Negro, which positioned her as a pioneer of the Black arts movement of the 1960s and 70s, critics have noted that her works are semi-autobiographical. But as theater critics Hilton Owls has noted, quote, but as usual in Kennedy's plays, the autobiographical strain is not direct, end quote. Owls' comment is valid for Kennedy's oeuvre until we get to, Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles? To the casual eye and ear, Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles is a memory play. Documentary theater as a genre and a form may be more fitting for what Adrienne Kennedy and her son Adam are doing in Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles? In short, the play details Kennedy's experience and experiences in London in the 1960s after accepting what she perceived to be an invitation to develop a play based on Beatles member John Lennon's book in his own right. However, when thinking about other plays that fall under the rubric of documentary theater, such as the Laramie Project by Tectonic Theater, one is reminded of how the plays are constructed through community. With Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles, Kennedy is the only person to document through narration her experiences. Kennedy, nonetheless, what Kennedy offers in this play is a critical en engagement with the flaws of society. Throughout the play, in an interview style, Kennedy is asked several questions by her son, Adam, in which she is propelled to reflect on a period of her life where she consecutively encounters actress Diana Sands, actors Victor Bispinetti and James Earl Jones, writer James Baldwin, socialite Ricky Houston, theater royalty Laurence Olivier, and of course, the Beatles. Carol Martin offers a brief rumination on the use of documentary theater, also recognized as documentary play or theater of testimony. Martin states, quote, those who make documentary theater interrogate specific events, systems of belief, and political affiliations precisely through the creation of their own version of events, beliefs, and politics. Martin summarizes in six points the basic principles of documentary theater. One, to reopen trials. Two, to create additional historical accounts. Three, to reconstruct an event. Four, to intermingle autobiography with history. And five, to critique the operations of both documentary and fiction, and finally, to elaborate the oral culture of theater. Documentary theater for Adrian Kennedy is a style that is particularly befitting as this mode of theater making can be traced to traditions of oral history, thus connecting her as she does throughout her oeuvre to an Africanist sensibility. Oral history is a key trope pertinent to African-American and African diaspora drama and performance as it is profoundly rooted in an African diasporic system with the originating purpose of historical recording. In spaces that are demarcated for cultural expression, there happens to be a common form of participation. That participation for Black folk, diasporically speaking, is the use of language. Yet in order to discuss language, one must discuss the duality in which language exists. In Decolonizing the Mind, Ngugi Watiango posits that, that duality into the areas of culture and communication. Theorized in and stemming from the diasporic terms, oral tradition, oral literature, and orator, the oral performer uses language as an image forming agent. Echoing Harry Elam Jr. in his study of characterization in the dramas of African-American playwrights, namely August Wilson, Adrian Kennedy performs as an oral historian as she repeatedly speaks her history while we, the audience, consider its meaning and thus creating an authentic historical record with multiple and multi-layered meanings. According to Gary Fisher Dawson, Documentary theater is a form of persuasive theater that can come as close as possible to an actual event with the exclusive reliance upon documentation from historically accurate materials. However, not all plays follow the goal of reliving the actual event. 
In other words, not all performances under the, fall under the rubric of documentary theater, which aspire to recreate the occurrence through dramatic reenactment. Rather, some documentary theater attempts to conjure the emotions, feelings, and or perspectives of those affected by the event through memory recall. Dawson further notes, quote, more directly, documentary theater is a theater genre in which primary source documentation is directly incorporated into dramatic text and the performance text of each play and a documentary play is one that has had conferred upon it by the institution called theater, the status of documentary play for the purpose of learning about, recalling, interpreting or responding to a historical moment. Additionally, Dawson infers that documentary theater has a didactic quality to it. From a feminist perspective, which is directly tied to Adrian Kennedy's oeuvre, documentary theater has the potential to dismantle hierarchical ways of learning and disseminating information about an event or subject or experiences. For example, by placing focus on a black woman's experience as Kennedy does in Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles? Kennedy challenges the dominant narrative by placing attention on an already marginalized group. Thus, in thinking about other black feminist and socially engaged theater artists who employ documentary theater, Kennedy's efforts closely resemble those of Anna Devere Smith and Glenda Dickerson. In this sense, I am thinking about how Kennedy, Smith and Dickerson respectively provided a space for the ignored others to be seen and heard, to tell their stories and to emerge from the shadows to which they have been co-signed by societal institutions that neglect or suppress them and by the media which stereotypes or erases them. Kennedy's narrative follows in the tradition of black women writers to quote scholar Joanne Braxton, who used literature by way of the African-American oral tradition or spiritual narrative and bearing witness to define their experiences and recall a coming to consciousness of self in a world that does not treasure, nurture, or protect Black women. In this vein, the mother and son discussion presented in the play offers a glimpse into the pre-celebrity playwright era in which Adrian Kennedy would soon traverse. For instance, audiences will come to know that Kennedy and her husband, Joseph, split not long after having two children together. They learn of her seemingly close relationship with her mother and her fascination with Olivier. While audiences will come to know Adrian Kennedy a bit more, they may even perhaps come to empathize with her as she illustrates a moment in her life where she was pretty vulnerable, especially economically and like so many aspiring artists, was in search of fame and fortune. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Long. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Next, we have Kristen Wright. Thank you. Um, before I sort of dive into my close reading, which is on um, Kennedy's play, The Owl Answers, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why Kennedy is important and also discuss her connection to Ohio State a little more. So uh, broadly speaking, um, you know, she is one of the playwrights who emerged alongside the Black Arts Movement in the 1960s, which also sort of emerges out of a sort of pan-African global anti-colonial struggle. And also she's very um, distinguished for her formal innovations. So her plays are often very short, uh, one act plays. They're very visual, um, especially in a playwriting format that prizes language. So Kennedy borrows a lot from film and television and visual art and the novel as well. And then in terms of um, her sort of going to Broadway for the first time at, at 90 years old, which is remarkable in many ways, um, it's a lot of that because of those formal um, innovations. So when we think of dramas by uh, Kennedy's peers, um, so people like Lorraine Hansberry and August Wilson in the mid, mid to late 20th century that made it to Broadway, we think of these sort of full length, you know, two, three act works of realism. And so a big exception to that is uh, Ntozake Shange who wrote for Colored Girls, but Kennedy's work is even much more abstract than Shange's and has also been perceived as being more challenging um, too. I know I attended 
Um, he brought her heart back in a box um, at a Theater for a New Audience in Brooklyn back in 2018. And a lot of the, the talk back, the post show talk back, was spent sort of trying to explain the play to the audience. So, um, you know, like, think of that framing and, and you know, a lot of it makes sense. Um, but in terms of Ohio State, so uh, Adrian Kennedy graduated from Ohio State in 1949 with a BA in education. And it was a very unhappy experience for her at Ohio State. Um, she experienced a lot of racism. And so Ohio State Murders, which is the play that's going to Broadway with Audrey McDonald, is probably the most conventional of her plays. Um, it's really a memory play about Suzanne Alexander, who's a successful writer um, who was also an Ohio State uh, undergraduate in the 1940s, 50s. Um, but also, you know, of course, it's Kennedy's own memory play. And so this Suzanne Alexander character has returned to Ohio State to give a lecture on the violent imagery in her work, which is obviously directly connected to the trauma that she experienced as an undergrad. And so this trauma in the play um, includes sort of these unfounded accusations of plagiarism, um, which forced her to switch her major from English to elementary education, uh, an abusive sexual relationship with her English professor, um, a man named Robert Hampshire. And so um, Alexander gives birth to twin girls who were later killed by Robert Hampshire too. And there's also a lot of sort of self-harm that she enacts upon herself too. And so another really important part of Ohio State Murders is um, Alexander's discussion of how she and sort of other Black female friends of her were not allowed to participate in the social life of the university. So, you know, Black women are not allowed to go to the dorm parties. They're not allowed to walk on frat row. Um, and uh, she, Alexander has a friend named Iris Ann, who is her best friend and a top musician in her hometown who cannot participate in the school orchestra. Black students are able to sort of go to class but not participate in the social and extracurricular life in, at Kennedy's Ohio State. And, you know, this panel, um, you know, we were told to sort of discuss the lasting impact of Kennedy's work. And so part of that is that, you know, the, the reality of Black student life at predominantly white institutions has not changed a whole lot from Kennedy's time to the present. And it's sort of disturbingly still relevant today. And so, um, so I didn't want to talk about Ohio State, but um, most of the remainder of my remarks are going to focus on uh, a more representative play of Kennedy's called The Owl Answers. And so specifically, I want to discuss the surrealism and the iconography of the train in the play. So The Owl Answers is a 1965 uh, companion piece to her most famous play, Funny House of a Negro, which Khalid already mentioned. And so in The Owl Answers, uh, Clara Passmore is a young woman who is on a train journey. And the train is repurposed as a 20th century slave ship, a cramped, fetid enclosure that is a rapidly moving site of terror, thrusting the protagonist on a seemingly never ending journey into the abyss. Kennedy begins her play with stage directions that situate the train not only as a static set, but as a site of dislocation. She begins The scene is a New York subway, is the Tower of London is a Harlem hotel room, is St. Peter's. In Kennedy's imaginary, the subway is not simply a train car, but a multivariate location that contains both English history, the Tower of London is the site of Anne Boleyn's imprisonment, and the hyperlocal CD hotel room. The train also embodies the flight to the chapel where the protagonist Clara's father is buried. In addition to the violences of the tower and hotel room, the train also represents the longing for salvation and reconciliation represented by St. Peter's. Kennedy's mise-en-scene is also characterized by cacophonous sound, light, and color. The scene should lurch, lights flash, gates slam. When they come in and exit, they move in the manner of people on a train, too. There is the noise of the train, the sound of moving steel on the track. Kennedy's description conveys a manic energy and contains the first usage of they, including the previously mentioned Anne Boleyn, representing a horde that is both anonymous and historically textured, a group that will terrorize Clara throughout the play. And of course, there is that lingering track, that scraping of steel left in its wake. 
and the owl answers, Clara's presence on the train is met with an immediate combination of revulsion and suspicion by the other characters. Even her own mother asks her, Blaster's Baxter's black mother, what are you doing on the subway if you are his ancestor? Anne makes a circular cross around the stage until she is back in the position she started at. She, I am Clara Passmore. I am not his ancestor. I ride, look for men to take to a Harlem hotel room, to love, dress him as my father, be to take me. The bastard's black mother asks her daughter why she is in the hold of the ship, the car of the train, if she is truly part of a privileged lineage. Why must she so desperately seek connection with her father if she is already part of his family? The mother then circles her daughter as if to further scrutinize her child's motives before the mother transforms into Anne Boleyn, another discarded woman. Clara is forced to admit that she is not a part of her father's distinguished white lineage, but is instead reduced to groping in the arms of men who might wear her father's costume but are inadequate imitations of the actual man. Clara's pursuit of men to imitate her white father mirrors uh, to invoke a Baraka play, um, Black Arts Movement, Lula's pursuit of, pursuit of Black men in The Dutchman. However, while Lula is clearly the aggressor, her pursuit of clay is motivated by a desire to express her white supremacist dominance. Clara, in the Kennedy play, is the prey who longs for a reunion that she will never have. And the owl answers, denial of humanity occurs through the erasure of Black women's names. In Kennedy's text, Clara's dead father, identifies Clara as the daughter of somebody that cooked for me. He does not refer to Clara or her mother by name, nor does he acknowledge his rape of Clara's mother or fraternity of Clara. Like the children of enslaved women, Clara is marked as chattel, the issue of a nameless black woman who labored in a white household. She finally names her biological father, Mr. William Matheson, and says that she believes his father comes from England. Matheson is the only character given a title marking him as the most important figure in the world of the play. By linking Matheson's father to England, Kennedy creates a genealogy of white supremacy, a genealogy carried into the new world with the birth of his son. When Clara links herself to these men, she tries to create a connection that will drive her futile journey to reconcile with her father. Whiteness is, is emulated with the hope that it will protect, but it is also a source of terror. Though black people are societally regarded as terror's embodiment, um, Christina Sharp argues that they are the primary objects of terror's multiple enactments, the ground of terror's possibility globally. Sharp situates terror as a planned and historical event that is simultaneously atemporal. And the owl answers, Clara is terrorized by historical apparitions that simultaneously appear out of relation to time. In the beginning of the play, the audience sees that the tower gate should be black, yet slam like a subway door. The gate slams. Poor people enter from different directions. They are Shakespeare, William the Conqueror, Chaucer, and Anne Boleyn. Kennedy reintroduces the audience to the cacophonous train noise and the foreboding evil of a confined space. However, the mise-en-scene is complicated with an atemporal confrontation with history. The previously mentioned figures who confront Clara have leapt from English history to the confines of the train. Shakespeare is regarded as a preeminent writer in the English language, William the Conqueror was the first Norman king of England. Chaucer was regarded as a preeminent poet of the Middle Ages. And Anne Boleyn, who has been previously mentioned, is regarded as one of the most powerful queen consorts in history. All four characters were known for their ability to conquer and dominate the lingering ghosts of the imperial past. With the appearance of these characters, Kennedy has reached back to the annals of history to discover the sources of white supremacist fervor. The wake is not only represented by the passage of a train or attempts to negotiate the denial of black humanity and the terror of whiteness. Wake is also consciousness seeking a resolution to blackness's ongoing and irresolvable abjection and representing the awareness of itself as and in the wake of the unfinished project of emancipation. Abjection is a state of being cast off and to be black is to be in a state of constantly being cast off, disregarded by society. And the owl answers, abjection is most acutely experienced at the moments that Clara dies, literally casting her off from this earthly plane. It is this moment of he most heightened consciousness, this moment of deep yearning for liberation, when Black life, which has previously tried to negotiate existence through confinement and respectability, is extinguished. 
In Kennedy's play, Clara's death is marked by her transformation into an owl. He grabs her down center, she kneeling. I call God and the owl answers, softer. It haunts my tower calling, its feathers blowing against the cell wall. Speckled in the garden on the fig tree, it comes, feathered, great hollow eyed with yellow skin and yellow eyes, the flying bastard. From my tower, I keep calling and the only answer is the owl, God. Pause, stands. I am only yearning for our kingdom, God. Clara has spent the train ride yearning for a holy reunion with her father, who is a symbolic God in her eyes, but her pleas are returned by the visage of the owl. Furthermore, the owl is a flying bastard who is speckled and has yellow skin and yellow eyes. Clara remains a bastard, an abject figure to her white family. Yet she is marked by her speckled yellowness, representing her mixed race phenotype. Due to this identity, she will never be admitted to the kingdom of whiteness. However, death does not occur until Clara's final struggle against the dead father, Negro man and the ubiquitous they, the cast of white historical figures who have been terrorizing her throughout the play. Suddenly she breaks away, Kennedy begins, with the draws of the butcher knife, still with blood and feathers upon it, and very quickly tries to attack him, holds the knife up, aiming it at him, but then dropping it just as suddenly in a gesture of wild weariness. He backs farther, the Negro man. She falls down onto the side of the burning bed. Clara attempts to break away from the death sentence that has been placed upon her by society and is overcome by a last gasp desire to attack the characters who have been terrorizing her. But ultimately she collapses with fatigue, knowing that any continued fight would simply be futile. The Negro man can withdraw any physical force at this point because he realizes that Clara's psyche has been defeated. The play ends when Sit Clara suddenly looks like an owl and lifts her bowed head, stares into space and speaks. Owl, owl. Clara is transformed into the owl that previously mocked her, her abject transformation ending with its embodied vocalizations of owl, owl. The constant search for emancipation has extended into Clara's own afterlife. Thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Wright, thank you so much. So uh, it appears that uh, Leslie Ferris has been unable to, to join us. Um, she is in London right now. And I just wanted to let people know that uh, she seems to be having some uh, technical problems connecting from there. So, um, so I'm, I'm afraid she, she won't be with us this at this time. So um, we have some time now to discuss uh, the work of Dr. Long and Dr. Wright. Um, I have a, a, a uh, the, the, the play that you talked about, uh, Dr. Wright, really uh, just evoked all kinds of images. And one of the things that I was thinking about is this, this sort of um, kind of struggle with all of these these historical figures and and it it, it brought to mind very much um, you know how Walcott's uh, dream on Monkey Mountain that uh, the apotheosis scene at the end uh, that that uh, it, it it sort of pulls up a bunch of different figures uh, that represent different aspects of, of whiteness and, and uh, uh, white oppression and their attempt to sort of uh, uh, purge those figures. But I was thinking too about just uh, 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 Adrienne Kennedy's love of English literature too. Uh, she she once said that uh, uh, the work of the Bronte sisters was her her favorite uh, work, and uh, you know how she she um, pulls on all of these various threads as as you know kind of like the way Christopher Marlowe always did, just like all of this vast historical and literary knowledge that that ends up getting woven. Uh, into her work, um, and uh, but and so I'm curious about that, about you know how how uh, English literature, despite being turned away as as a uh, somebody who who wanted to major in English, um, and she said, of course, she was very unhappy. Uh, she she found um, education boring. Um, her exact words um, that, uh, uh, but I'm I'm curious about. Uh, to the the symbolism of of the owl, you know, you 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 talk about the yellow skin, um, and her own mixed race identity, 
Um, and I'm thinking also just of, you know, the, the different times that birds, of course, have, have appeared as, as different kinds of signals at different, uh, different times, but particularly the owl. Um, so, yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind just, you know, kind of elaborating on, on all of the sort of complex imagery and, and uh, the symbolism that's going on in her play. Right. And so the sort of the imagery and the symbolism is uh, really um, a thread throughout all of Kennedy's work. So there's like all, always symbolism and imagery. And so we see sort of, you know, William the Conqueror and Anne Boleyn, um, who is sort of like this imperial figure, but also like Clara is a kind of a woman who was discarded um, after she had sort of outlived her usefulness, you know, she couldn't produce a son for Henry VIII. So like, I mean, there was a lot of things happening, but basically she couldn't produce a son. So, you know, her head was chopped off, you know, and, and everything. And so I think that, um, you know, Kennedy is, um, there's a critique of imperialism, but there's also a commentary, like a feminist commentary about how women are disposable. Like, even if you are like a white queen, you know, like they don't care about you either too. And I think that the, um, sort of the owl is, um, you know, a sort of uh, a, a creature that is kind of calling out in the darkness. Similarly, mm -hmm. Clara Passmore is in the subway, in the bowels, in the slave ship, trying to call out, trying to be heard, trying to be acknowledged by anyone. And, you know, in, in a way, you know, the owl answers is like, I call out and the owl answers, like I call out and the only thing that I can hear is my own voice because nobody is paying attention. And I think mm -hmm. that's the sort of the core, um, the core, image of the play and the core experience of being a black woman um you know you call out and you know we we, we are the only people who who've got us like we're the only people who care about us and and you know it's sort of kennedy um reflecting on her experiences as a black woman you know reflecting on her experiences at ohio state you know we are all we've got like i am i am all i i have and and so it's, it's a very um dark message but it's a very truthful one um too and you know kennedy is is not really known for um offering like optimism like in, in, right. in her plays and at all so i think it it all it's all connected too so oh wonderful and a nice parallel with dutchman too i thought was was right really, really fantastic um Can, dr long go ahead now, I wanted to jump in and just sort of add a little bit to uh, what Christian is, is describing here, right? I was, I think about it, there's an essay that I really, really like um, by Margaret Wilkerson um, from the Intersecting Boundaries, uh, uh, the book Intersecting Boundaries, The Theater of Agent Kennedy, um, edited by Paul Jackson and Lois Overbeck. And when she uses the term imagistic, right, to describe what's happening with um, Andrew Kennedy's works. And I think what's really important is, you know, in addition to thinking about Andrew Kennedy in the context of surrealism, expressionist theater, avant-garde and so forth, right, a pioneer, particularly among Black artists of the 60s and 70s, um, and really in many ways pushing the bounds of the Black arts movement, right? And what they were, what they were attempting, what they were allowed to do, and even think about how she was critiqued by some of those figures. And then later on sort of saying, no, actually, she deserves to be at the center of what we were attempting to do with our work, um, um, right? Uh, for me, what I recognize is that she uses, for me, I think about the ways in which she uses images because she was locked out of the kind of everyday language that most people were privy to, including men and white folk, right? Um, and so out, if, if she's locked out of sort of using everyday language to express and to share her experiences, and in many ways to sort of call out, right? Um, the injustices, right? Then how do I create a kind of language that is my very own? And in many ways that language then mirrors sort of what was happening internally, right? Um, the kind of images um, that is sort of, you know, bound all of her work. I think like in her later place, right? So think about like Sleep Deprivation Chain Chamber, um, Ohio State Murders, and as well as Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles, a bit more accessible in terms of the use of language and a bit more clear in terms of narrative structure, right? But those earlier works, I think it's just amazing that, you know, we, we, she's a pioneer, right? In, in the context of Black folks, Black women, Black artists, and then American theater in general, using images as a way to express express vulnerabilities when you have been locked out historically uh, right by the written word you know yeah great we have a, a couple of questions from panelists and i see for a second like leslie ferris was with us and and isn't anymore shoot 
but she she was able to to hear uh, both of of your presentations. Yeah, she seems to have, have dropped off again, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, Julia Watson has a a, a question uh, that that hasn't been typed in yet, but uh, does have a question for both panelists. Um, oh, I, yeah, unfortunately, I can't enable your your microphone. Um, it seems to to be because we're in a webinar format. It seems to be type only. Um, but uh, we'll we'll go ahead and type your question, and I'll I'll move on to to uh, Joe Fay. He has a question. I would love to hear some insights about staging practices for these plays. Have you seen some approaches that have uh, struck you um, and are especially effective at communicating these complex, often fractured stories to a broader audience? Yeah, I mean, I could jump in um, and with that too. Um, yeah, just a couple of things too. I mean, I've seen like readings and full productions, sort of various sort of levels of, of staging of Kennedy. Um, I remember a Gail Cabaret production of Funny House, like probably like over 10, 10 years ago now, um, where uh, it was Liliana Blank Cruz directed, who's like a big, you know, big stage director now. But it was a, um, it was you know, Funny House, and it used a lot. I was struck by the use of music. So they, um, Nicki Minaj's Stupid Ho, you know, played um, as like Sarah, the protagonist, like pro progressively unraveled more and more. And then also too, I mean, I've seen like you know, Kennedy is visual. We've talked about that at the Tafana production of He Brought Her Heart Back in a Box, they had a whole big diorama of Montefiore, um, Georgia, which is the fictional town that's based on um, Montezuma, Georgia, which you know Kennedy has connections to as well. We could situate her as a Southern playwright. I could, I could talk a lot about that. But um, so I've seen sort of use of music, um, dioramas to sort of convey, convey what is going on. Um, lots of use of like, um, light and shadow and the lighting design, lots of use of sound effects um, and um, a, a lots of use of props as well. There was a moment in the He Brought Her Heart Back in a Box production where we literally see like a skeleton um, dressed in clothes to sort of represent this sort of dead, white, evil dead, white ancestor figure as well in the play. And so there's a, a lot of, um, a lot of sort of risk taking that happens in these stagings of Kennedy a lot of sort of visual and theatrical combining. And I think that um, I brought up the Nicki Minaj because like a lot of her, you know, even though her work is sort of rooted in the past and these sort of old Hollywood film stars in English literature, it can, be, it can be pulled to the contemporary moment. It can be pulled to Nicki Minaj. It can be pulled to sort of speaking about the black student experience on campus today. And so it is like very flexible in that way too. We have another question from, oh, sorry, Dr. No, Lewis. no, I'm trying to, you know, I'm working from like two different devices. Right, right. right. <laughs> I was wondering. I was, I, was, like... I was thinking, I remember when I was an undergrad, we did like sort of a, a you know, my, uh, this is well over 10, 15 years ago. We did like a reading of Funny House of a Negro, which I mean, which, it, which is interesting is because Funny House of a Negro becomes like the play that most students, you know, are in, that's how we're introduced to Adrian Kennedy, right? Because it's the most anthologized in many ways. So, you know, in college programs, we have the anthologies. And I remember we did like a, we did, and we just use a lot of sort of, you know, props and things, right? And my memory is sort of like fading in that area. Most recently, I was thinking about Ford Theater's production of Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles? What I thought was really interesting is that it, it sort of humanizes Adrian Kennedy um, in that production, who in, in many ways is kind of a mysterious figure in terms of her own personal life, um, with the exception of some of her, you know, uh, 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 nonfiction writings outside of her dramatic works. Again, as the autobiographical, there are strains throughout the work. But when you get to my mom, how did you meet the Beatles? You get sort of a fuller picture of her life and experiences and not necessarily judgment, right? But sort of insight, right? Into her experiences where she's like, you know, I was quite naive, I was quite young, you know, I was vulnerable. Um, and I also in many ways didn't recognize what was being done to me, right, until much later where I was able to reflect on the ways of the world. What I really enjoyed about that particular production is that, like, there were moments where we saw Adrian Kinney with a cigarette. We saw that there was, like, a pouring of, like, what seemed to be whiskey, right, those kind of humanistic traits um, 
you know, things that sort of, you know, materialize her as a very real person outside of sort of the imagistic views that we get in the other plays, you know, and so forth. Um, but those are like my only sort of experiences with seeing the production and so forth. But I also want to acknowledge that, you know, for directors and dramaturgs and writers, what Adrian Kennedy also gives us is sort of this kind of open, capacious view of her work, where then it leaves a lot up to those who are staging her plays, as opposed to a tight, rigid sort of staging that many playwrights who use realism provide for us. Great, wonderful. Um, I, I see Leslie in the in the attendees room, and I'm wondering if uh, any of the people who are hosting uh, can can get her into. Here we go into our, here we are. Get her onto the, the panel part. So it'd be great to hear from her. I guess while we're getting Leslie in the room Ooh. too, I wanted to mention too that I saw, um, was a YouTube reading since, you know, digital performance is so big. Uh, he brought her heart back in a box at the Yale Art Gallery that was on YouTube. and. I think what was interesting about that is that um, Evan Yanoulis, who was directing that, showed us images of of um, Kennedy's hometown, sort of including the sort of the you know the school that um, Atlanta University was was based on, and and um, and so like all of these you know again coming back to the visual um, and and sort of involving the audience in the the dramaturgy around the play too. Oh, fabulous! Great. Any luck getting? Leslie into the into the regular participant uh, room at all. Jade or Alex. And she she may have dropped off. No, she's still there. Can she type in the Q and A? <laughs> yeah, she she can. She did to say. That she was here and she saw everything. Awful. I keep if, trying to invite her, but I could I, someone send her the other link, maybe. I wonder. Oh yeah. That's a good idea. Um, I'll I'll work on that. I will read uh, a, a question from Anna Puga while uh, I try to to bring Leslie in. Um, Anna said, it seems to me that part of what is radical about her work is that she claims white culture is part of her own culture, like in Funny House of a Negro, in which parts of the protagonist are both uh, uh, Patrice Lumumba and Queen Victoria, or in a movie star has to star in black and white when the white movie stars begin to speak the words of the young black woman protagonist. Um, so um, I... Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I think, well, I think part of, especially with like the movie stars, so like, you know, um, Jean Tierney and, and, you know, Betty Davis and all, all of those ladies, I think it shows how hegemonic um, sort of, yeah. you know, white culture is. Because like, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we think colloquially, colloquially of, you know, things as being sort of for black people or for white people, but it's like, you know, Black people love Marvel movies and Star Wars. Like I love Star Wars and anime and you know things like that. Like there's this is this is sort of global like culture as as well too. Um, and but I think also too what Kennedy is good at, at is um, showing the kind of the, the terror that sort of white culture wreaks on Black yeah. people. So mm -hmm. you know Al answers he brought a heart back in a box. Funny how like there's always the sort of the terror of the white father, like the sort of the, the white, you know, rapist father. And so like this sort of, um, you know, her sort of ruminations on culture also sort of reflecting on like cultural violence and, you know, these em embodied enactions of violence too. Right, right. I, I think in many ways, uh, um, Kristen, you said this earlier and, I, and I, I took note of this. I really like how you phrase this and that is like whiteness as rescuer and whiteness as terror, right? And the, we can hold both of those spaces. What I think is really important about Adrian Kennedy's work is that it's not just simply about whiteness, right? But it's about colonialism. 
right? So if we think, because oftentimes we talk about whiteness, we're talking about it from like the American borders, right? But if we talk about colonialism, that allows us to talk about, sort of have more of a global perspective, but it also allows us to sort of have a historical perspective about how then things were able to animate such as racism, homophobia, right? Anti-Blackness, right? Like specific things as a result of colonialism. You know, and so thinking about like, for instance, with Funny House of a Negro, and then sort of paralleling her with, with um, Rain Hansberry, A Raise in the Sun, and more specifically, Le Blanc. You know, Adrian Kennedy was a pioneer in terms of Amer African-American playwrights, specifically in terms of their own identity, not categorizing her because she hates that categorization, being called an African-American playwright or a Black playwright. But they were the first to like put Africa on the stage, right? Mm -hmm. Within the context of African-American drama, dramatic literature and performance, right? And in doing so, again, this harkens to the idea that is not simply about whiteness as a rescuer and or terror, but it's also about like the effects of colonialism and who, what race is sort of at the center in terms of power and who's controlling, right, the effects of colonialism. Um, um, I was going somewhere with this and I lost my thought, so I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> I, I, well, gosh. Go ahead. I, I wanted to jump in on that too, because <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with all of that. Like, I think especially, I'm glad that you brought up Hansberry too, because I feel like with Hansberry, and Kennedy, like people tend to sort of flatten their sort of anti-colonial like impulses, right? And that's so so central to what what they do as is playwrights. Okay, right. But Everyone, just real quickly, Leslie Ferris is in the room. <laughs> She's made it. Um, so so, uh, Dr. Ferris, if you wouldn't mind just uh, going ahead real quickly and introduce yourself and and jump in with any thoughts that you've had or or anything that you oh, want. Yes. To Oh my gosh, that was so frustrating. Can you oh, actually, so sorry. See, can you see me? Uh, no, we, no, we can't. can't. See you. you have to but turn. Can hear, but can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, Lordy, Lordy. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'll say a couple of things. I don't know how much time I have, but um, it's short. Mine was going to be per short anyways. That's uh, my title was my personal relationship with Adrian. Um, and I just, uh, one of the, First things I say is 20 years ago when I moved to Columbus, one of my three reasons for moving to Columbus was that she was an alum, uh, but I didn't know about um, her time there. I mean, obviously I did learn it later. Mm -hmm. Obviously she discusses it both in People Who Led to My Plays, but Ohio State Murders is the play that about that. Um, and from my understanding of it, she, I, the understanding of what happened to her at Ohio State obviously racism. And mm -hmm. one aspe aspect of that is she wanted to be, get a major in English mm -hmm. and she was not allowed to, mm -hmm. she had to do education. And so she, she was able to take a few courses in English, but not, a, not, a, no, not the main thing. Mm -hmm. And so she hated education, needless to say. And when we did the honorary doctorate for her, because she had her degree in education, we had to invite the education people to meet up with her. And she told them off. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> it was just absolutely unbelievably great. I was so impressed by that. Um, so it was, yes, it was really, really funny. Um, and I wanted to talk about the honorary doctorate as well. These are just kind of amazing things that have happened. Um, so she was nominated for one by our department and she received it. And we did a whole like quarter long of series of events related to her. And one of them was a production that I directed, Sleep Deprivation Chamber. Mm -hmm. um, she did not come to see it, unfortunately, um, but Adam K Kennedy did, her co-author son of that piece. And um, it was amazing because it was the first time the department had ever done anything with the, um, uh, the, the, the compute, computer arts and science people. So the projections and things were absolutely amazing and very exciting. Um, but when she when she came, she did come to receive the honorary doctorate, and I took her around campus prior to the event. She wanted to see the dorm. She stayed where she stayed as a student, and at the point at that point, she told me um, how unhappy she was in there because she was in the black area. She couldn't talk to other people, etc. I mean, not, I mean, she obviously at least had a few friends there, but she still was unhappy. Um, and the okay. evening before graduation, her, her family was invited to attend, obviously, the dinner. Uh, 
and meet others receiving awards. And when I arrived with her, I actually, I actually um, hired a, a, a car that looked really nice because I didn't want her to have to drive in mine, which was messy. So for that whole weekend, um, I used the car for her. Um, she said to me in a whisper while we're sitting there for dinner, she goes, I need to leave. And I went, I kind of whispered back, what? And she, um, she said, yes. And I just assumed it meant she needed to go to the restroom. However, it wasn't that at all. She was so nervous and kind of overcome. She um, said, no, I want to go to my hotel room. Mm -hmm. So she did. I mean, I took her there and I came back and every, the dinner had just finished. Um, and, uh, but people were talking about the different people winning stuff and one of her, her grandson raised his hand. I did get to see this and I was so happy um, uh, because the grandson got up on the stage. It was just impromptu and they had to adjust the microphone for him. I think he was like 10 or 11, maybe 12 at the most. And um, he said, I had no idea that my grandmother was famous and that people are having this event for her. And he, and he said, I've known her all these years and I adore her, but I'm just so happy. And he, he said a lot more than that, but it was just, it was amazing. Was, was this uh, Kanan? Leslie? Sorry? Kanan? Was this Kanan? Kennedy? No, it wasn't. It wasn't him. It was another one of the other grandsons. I asked her the other day about this actually in an email. Um, uh, okay, so uh, what else? But she did sign, she showed, I was so worried she wouldn't show up at the event, but she did. And she looked great. And she sat up on, you know, next to the president on the, in this huge place where it was all happening. It was a spring, so it was outside in the, the football stadium. Um, and uh, no, she, she sat near a famous filmmaker, I can't remember his name right now, but who also got the honorary doctorate. And she thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, and after that, after that, she did tell me um, that more than once she's appreciated the event so much that it took away most of the Ohio State murders, anger, and et cetera, et cetera. That feeling, yeah, great. Yeah, and one more thing I just did, do I still have a few more minutes? Yeah, just, just one okay. more minute. Okay, well, I really got to know her personally though, is when I, did, when I directed, a movie star has to star in black and white in New York. So she was living in New York, she loved New York. Um, and uh, she invited me to come to her apartment numerous times. And what she did is she put down the photographs of her family because she's told me many times that that, that particular play is about a, mem is a memorial to her parents. Um, and uh, it, it was just incredible. So I, would, I directed it. Um, and I just loved working on it. I got to really know her, see her, help her do her shopping. And um, I was worried, I mean, I, she was invited to come obviously. And I knew that she's not keen on coming. Mm -hmm. So I hope she would, but I, I couldn't do anything about it. She just, in fact, she told me, no, she probably couldn't, wouldn't come. So at the preview, I was sitting in the theater and um, it all went extremely well, the production. And it was a, had a small audience because it was the preview. And um, I was with a friend and I said, can you look behind me and see if there's anybody in the back of us? And she was back there with Adam and she was crying her eyes out. Just, it was unbelievable. So I asked, so I went and got the cast to come up and meet her and they all, st everybody started crying. They couldn't believe they were actually meeting her. So yeah, so that was that. And also I was glad to hear the mention of um, uh, mom, how did you meet the Beatles? I yeah. love that play, I love it. And actually I did, a, I, I have a theater company here in London called uh, Palind Palindrome Productions. And I did a stage reading of it. I didn't direct it. I, had, I got another director, but I said really two good actors um, that did it and it was great. I really think somebody in London should produce it properly, you know, like not a right. stage reading. Um, so, but the amazing, um, okay. So the other thing about that, uh, the Beatles play is that um, 
this is so amazing. People that came to see it, uh, there was a group, it wasn't huge, but they were there. And one of the fellows raised, wanted to ask a question. He said, is there any way I can talk to her in a way or email her? And I said, well, I think it'll have to be on, um, you know, in an email, I'll have to ask her. And he, he said, well, this group I'm with here is the London's Beatles plant fan club. <laughs> we want to get connected. Oh, <laughs> so I'll, well, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it at that for now. That's, that's actually good. Cause that, that brings us to a, a, another question that was posted by Julia Watson, uh, talking about the uh, autobiographical in Adrian Kennedy, that it's a complex issue because the persona avatar in her place has both striking parallels to her own life, but is distanced in multiple ways. Uh, yeah. starting with a persona or avatar with a different name and often experiences. Uh, Braxton's suggestion about bearing witness is helpful, but the play seemed to serve as more what we in autobio studies call an alternative jurisdiction to the court in making a kind of indictment. How can this tension of closeness slash distance be staged so that audiences experience both uh, as a kind of alienation? So um, uh, uh, that might be an interesting if uh, both Dr. Wright and Dr. Long want to sort of uh, jump into uh, answering really quickly, we have a couple of minutes left and, and uh, we can end on, on that note. Yeah, that, that's such a rich question. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we see it in the, in the staging, in the embodied experience of Kay of Sarah, of Clara, of, you know, of all of these characters, Suzanne, um, Suzanne Alexander is the most sort of autobiographical embodiment of Kennedy. And we see her sort of experience refracted in these depictions of um, her life at Ohio State, you know, over the course right. of many decades. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that question. So, you know, again, they, 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 uh, and Professor Ferris, it's good to see you first and foremost. Yes, so I know. <laughs> It's I so realized beautiful. all this little text there that yeah. said, um, see, see the others or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I you know, and, and I was thinking about there, so I, when I was doing my dramaturgical research and creating the packet and so forth for Wisconsin production, I did mention the Palindrome production that was in sort of the production history um, because Mom, How Did You Read right. the Beatles has not received a lot of uh, right. stage, fully realized productions. Right. However, what I will say is one of the things that... Um, Ooh, I, oh God, please, Kevin Gawley, I think it was Kevin who designed, who did the design for the production. He also did, um, they also had projections and they, and they had projections behind Adrian and Adam as they were on the stage. And what the production projections did was sort of materialize for the audience, right? Mm -hmm. The various um, 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 things and the places and the people that yeah. she was talking about, mm -hmm. right? So that, so Adrian's walking around the stage and she's sort of playing with various props and things throughout the production. Um, and the, the, the person that played Adrian, her name is Marty, phenomenal performer in the Wisconsin area. And she's navigating the stage, but every, whenever she's mentioning something that is very real, right? Um, in terms of, you know, that actually happened or that does exist, such as the old Vic, right? Or where she oh, lived, wow. the various apartments she lived, which one she was put out as a result of racism and so forth, right? They would sort of put these, and not project the real picture, but these kinds of like scribbled images, right? These renderings yeah. were, you know, lack of a better term, right? Behind her, right? Those are one ways to think about it. But I also want to recognize that like, when I mentioned earlier in my talk, Adrian Kennedy is hard to define and categorize because her yeah. work, her body of works are sort of there's, they spill all over the place um, within the context of dramatic structure and form and genre, right? So really, I think it boils down to what particular production are we staging, right? right. And what it is that in, in verse, you know, and sort of paralleling that with the director's concept and vision as well. They're, none of yeah. them are in like strict realism. And yeah. so thinking about yeah. staging, it's hard to think about like, how does one stage versus the other one? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're we're completely out of time. Uh, this has been an amazing discussion, and uh, Dr. Ferris, I'm glad you you were able to get on. Oh, not only did you get my voice, you finally got my face. Yay. You finally got your face. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Kristen Wright, Dr. Khalid Long, thank you so much for this really interesting and insightful work that you're doing.
Um, and I will sign off now uh, on behalf of the Department of Theater, Film, and Media Arts here at The Ohio State University. Great. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>